Emergency Broadcast, Crimson Alert. Attention, this is an emergency broadcast, Crimson Alert. The danger is imminent, and there is no time to explain or prepare. If you are reading this now, do not go outside. Do not look at the sky. Do not trust your senses. Do not ju- Then the screen turned off. The lamps next to the television flickered briefly before readjusting themselves. I sat in my chair, still holding my can of orange soda, staring dumbstruck. What the fuck? I said softly. What the actual fuck? My phone began buzzing in my pocket, so I pulled it out instantly and checked. My girlfriend was calling me. I answered. Babe, did you get that? You mean the crimson alert thing? Yeah, that. Christ, I thought it was a fucking myth. Wait, what are you talking about? Jenny, what's going on? Look, there's an urban myth I've heard about this. It says that whenever there's a crimson alert, that means something really, really bad is coming. Like, not the end of the world bad, but still bad. I don't know how to describe it. But what I do know is this. Whenever there's a crimson alert, it never finishes. Think it's a prank? I asked nervously, still looking at my television screen. I don't know, okay? I just don't know. It could be, but then... I waited for Jenny to continue, and waited. Baby? I said nervously. Baby, you still there? Oh, sweet mother of God. Her voice was quiet as she whispered over the phone. There's... there's something outside. What? I said, sitting up. What is it? Then she hung up. I immediately tried to redial her, holding up the phone to my ear. The voice that came over the airwaves wasn't hers, however. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is unavailable. It is currently a crimson alert. All residents are advised to hide and not go outside. Not to look at the sky. Not trust their senses. And not just... There was a blast of static briefly. The robotic voice becoming distorted and repeating the last phrase again and again. Like a broken record. Then it hung up. I stared at my phone. No cell reception. Damn it! I said, throwing it to the side as I placed the can of orange soda down and began racing up to my room. To hell with it. The woman I cared about was out there. She was most likely in danger, and I wasn't going to sit in my house and do nothing. I had to save her. In my room, I began sorting through my drawers, trying to find something I could use to defend myself. I had no idea what was going on. It wouldn't hurt to have a weapon of some kind. All I found was a rosary, which I stuffed into my jacket before turning around. Outside, someone screamed. I immediately turned to my bedroom window, looking into the night. That was when I heard it. More screaming, but something was off about it. My curiosity got the better of me, and I slowly began walking over to the window. I had to see what was out there. I had... A face appeared. I cried out, stumbling backwards. The face watched me with dull eyes, gray and lifeless. I bolted out of my room and into the hallway. I didn't get far before I heard a pounding on my door, followed by an order. Open this door, said a large, imposing voice, one that sounded like it could strangle me with ease if I did. This is the police. Crimson alert is cancelled. Like the screams, there was something off about his voice. I thought back to what the crimson alert said. Do not trust your senses. What did that mean? The door was pounded on again. Open this door, said that large, imposing voice. This is the police. Crimson alert is cancelled. Go away, I shrieked at them. Another pounding of the door. Open this door, the large, imposing voice said again. This is the police. Crimson alert is cancelled. That was what was wrong. Not in how it repeated itself, but in the way it spoke. The pitch, the tone. The way it seemed to pound on the door, it was like a recording. Another pounding on the door, followed by that same demand. Hesitantly, I began to back away. I still needed to get outside and find Jenny. But how could I do that if I couldn't use the door? I licked my lips, trying to think. When something shattered downstairs, followed by a thud. There was a creak, glass crinkling. Then another as something heavy moved downstairs. A musky, foul odor hit my nostrils, like some kind of animal. I'd grown up in a farm, 
so it was used to most scents, from pigs to horses to goats. But this one felt like all those mixed together. It smelled like... Then I remembered the broadcast, saying I couldn't trust my senses. That meant I couldn't... When the magnitude of that hit me, my eyes widened and I stumbled backward, landing on my back in my room. I glanced at the window briefly. The face was gone. The pounding at the door resumed again, demanding that it be opened as the police were here and the crimson alert was cancelled, and those plodding thuds, almost like... like... memories came flooding back to me, of my life on the farm as a young boy. When the horses came into the stables, they'd walk slowly, their hooves clopping along the ground. This reminded me of that almost, and this smell, though like a mixture of different farm animals, a distinct underlying ting to it, like a... like a goat. Almost. Hesitantly, I poked my head outside my room at the floor below me. The plodding had come closer, and in the light of the lamps, I saw a shadow cast on the wall. On the unmistakable head of a human, silhouetted by the light, I could see two horns curving outward like a ram's. The torso of a shadow moved, lifting up one thin appendage before placing it back down, accompanied by another plodding thud. On the end, there was a stump resembling a hoof. Chapter 2 I watched as the shadow moved across the wall, slowly, with every plodding thud. That was all it took for me to shut the door of my room. I wasn't sure if what I was seeing was real, but I couldn't take any risks. Except for Jenny. As the plodding steps got closer and closer, I crawled underneath my bed. It was like those nights when I was on the farm. When, as a child, I would hide underneath it during a thunderstorm. I was almost embarrassed to be doing it now. The reason I wasn't was because the plodding thuds had reached the stairs and become heavy, pained creaks of wood. Each one coming closer and closer. With every step, the pounding on the door came back. But the large, imposing voice was now slurred and distorted. Open this door, they said. This is the police. Crimson alert is cancelled. <coughs> <coughs> and then they began choking and gargling, followed by a harsh, whooping cough, then a single pained gasp. A heavy thud on my porch as the choking, gargling, and coughing became quieter and quieter before stopping altogether. The creaking of the wood got louder. When it became softer, it turned and began marching towards my door. My unlocked door. I had to lock it, but that meant getting out from under my bed. And I couldn't trust my senses, could I? Was... was that shadow I'd seen even real? What if the heavy, plodding steps weren't either, or the pounding at the door? What if something was hiding, using those to distract me? What if it was inside this room with me now, underneath this very bed? What could I do? Pray, the voice of an elderly man said in my head. I blinked, and suddenly found myself back on the farm, a small boy, clutching my blanket to my chest. My granddad was sitting in a rocking chair, holding a tobacco pipe in one hand and smiling at me. Just pray, then you will know what to do. I dug my hand in my pocket, grabbed my rosary, and clenched the beads between my fingers, beginning to do just that. I said the Hail Mary automatically, something I hadn't done since I was a child. It was amazing how easily it came to me, how natural it all felt. And as I prayed, a wave of calm slowly descended upon me. There was another plodding step, so close it was almost outside my door. Without thinking, I crawled out from under the bed, rushed forward on my hands and knees, and reached up, turning the lock on my door so it was horizontal. Two more plodding steps followed, stopping on the other side of my door. The nasty, disgusting musk of a male goat wafted into my nostrils, overpowering every other scent. The door shuddering as something hit it from the other side. I recoiled, gripping my rosary between my fingers and scrambling backwards on my hand and feet. My back slammed against the bedpost. I would have crawled back under it until something began speaking from the other side. I froze breathing intently, 
The voice was low and feminine, slightly distorted, like it was speaking through static. But there was that unmistakable braying to it, the kind the goats made on the farm. Et, the voice hissed. Diabolus incarnate est et homos factus est. The door shuddered again, a bulge appearing as something dented it from the other side. I gripped the rosary in both hands, holding it in front of me and reciting the Hail Mary, the Our Father, the Glory Be, any prayer which sprang to mind. The door shuddered again, the bulge growing wider. I prayed harder. The door shuddered again, and the voice repeated itself, once again hissing those words. Its voice was rumbling and pained now. The feminine edge mixed with grating tone, like something shredding stone. The wood in the door was nearly split apart as the bulge deepened. A slit opened in it, through which dark, cloven bones briefly flashed across. Red, bristly furs ringed around the top. It disappeared. Then a goat's leg smashed through the slit. That voice spoke again, now louder, almost screaming the phrase. Et diablos incarnate est, et homos factus est. Go away! I shrieked, holding the rosary close to my chest. Go away, in the name of God. Then everything stopped. The goat's leg in my door remained still, the red, bristly fur standing straight on edge. Then, slowly, it pulled back, returning to the other side of the door. The wood closed around it, repairing itself like a wound, until there was no sign it had even been kicked in. I remained sitting on the floor, rosary buds clutched in shaking hands, waiting for the sound of those plodding hooves. It took a while before I realized I couldn't smell the musk of a male goat, but I still didn't move. The words of the Crimson Alert were still fresh in my mind. Don't go outside. Don't look at the sky. Don't trust your senses. And don't... Don't what? What was the last word? Did I even want to know? It's alright, laddie. Grandad's voice said in my head. Everything will be alright. However long the day, the evening will come. It was odd. Despite being years dead, I almost felt like he was in the room with me. I could still remember when he'd come over from the Emerald Isle visiting his son and family with a kind smile and laugh. He was never one to shy away from stories from home, recounting the ways people had lived in Ireland for thousands of years. Whenever I needed help, Grandad always told me either a proverb or some story. In this time, remembering the crimson alert which had flashed across my screen unfinished, I recalled one tale in particular. It was on a cloudy, stormy day when my Grandad told it to me. Mom and Dad were out getting groceries, and he was left to babysit. He was looking outside, smoking his tobacco pipe, when he asked me a question. Do you know how to check if someone is the devil? No, Grandad, I told him, eating a bowl of cereal. How do you check? Well, my Grandad said, taking a seat next to me. The devil always shows up in a disguise, you see. He's always hiding his true nature from us. But there's always something which gives him away. What is it? I asked him. His footprints, my granddad answered. So I have to look out for goat prints? I asked smiling. Then granddad shook his head. No, the devil's footprints don't look like a goat's. I blinked, the spoon in my hand suspended in midair. What do they look like? <sighs> my granddad sighed, pulling the pipe out of his mouth and turning to the side. He blew out a ring of smoke before standing up and walking over to the arts and crafts area. He set down his pipe gently, then picked up a red crayon and piece of paper, starting to draw. It only took three quick movements of his hand to finish before he turned around and held up his drawing for me to see. It was a capital V with a straight line down the middle. This is it, my granddad said, his voice grave. This is what the devil's footprints look like. If you ever see these, pray to the Virgin Mother, God, Jesus, and all the saints and angels to protect you, because that means the devil was walking the earth. When I came back to the present, I was still sitting against the bed, clutching the rosary in my hands. It was an old thing, made of wood and corded down brown string. 
the cross hanging from it, decorated with woven Celtic imagery. I'd bought it the last time I'd been to Ireland, from my grandfather's funeral. It was still in persistent condition, despite all these years of being hidden in my drawer. I'd only brought it because I thought it looked beautiful. Who'd have thought I'd actually use it? Certainly not me. I could have stayed in that room for the rest of the night, safe and sound, praying until the morning light. But my granddad's voice came back into my head. All that is needed for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. No one would know if I did nothing, right? They wouldn't blame me either. I had to stay alive. I couldn't deal with whatever the hell was happening. There was nothing I could do. But I would know. Jenny was out there, alone and afraid, with no one to keep her safe. The woman I love needed help. What kind of man was I to think of myself before others? Tentatively, I stood up, walking towards my door and unlocking it. As I pulled it open, the carpet in the hallway was marked by several black marks in two rows, smoke wafting from each one. They were like small semicircles, with a small split in the middle. The faint goat odor had infected the hallway, and I gagged as I walked down it. When my foot touched one of the marks, there was a hissing sound and I drew back instantly. But when I looked down at my shoe, the sole was completely bare of any marks. When I went downstairs, the house was empty. The black, burning semicircles led to a broken window. But there was no glass on the inside of the house, save a few sprinkles along the ground. I blinked at this until it clicked. The window had been broken from the inside. I inhaled sharply, and as the wind came through the window, it carried with it the scent of burning pork and goat musk, and Jenny's perfume. In the basement, there was a soft weeping, almost like a large, imposing voice from the door, followed by a thump. P -p -p ice. A voice croaked from the floorboards. Opet nu pno. Maybe something was playing a trick on me. I wasn't supposed to trust my senses. My sense of touch, my sense of taste, smell, hearing, and sight. The things we humans depend on. They wouldn't be of much help to me. But I didn't have much choice. I went to the back patio, searching for anything I could to protect myself with. I was still clutching my rosary when my hand grabbed a metal snow shovel, and I felt a blast of cold race up my arm. My fingers turned white, gripping onto the shovel, while I raised the rosary slowly and pressed it against the shovel. When the cross touched it, there was a scream. So quiet it sounded like it was miles away. No animals could have made the scream, or a person. I took the rosary off the shovel, and the screaming stopped. My hand let go, and instead grabbed onto something else, a baseball bat. I pressed the rosary against it, and nothing happened. I then looked around again, still formulating a plan, when I heard a child screaming outside. I was about to look outside when I paused. There was a door creaking open inside my house. Still holding the baseball bat, I went back inside. The screams got louder with every step until I was in the kitchen. Beside the fridge, the basement door had opened. A hand, burnt to a black crisp, suddenly lunged out of it, grabbing onto the smooth tile floor. Something began croaking incoherently. I ran forward, and with all of my might, brought the baseball bat down on it. The croaking stopped as the hand impacted against tiles leaving a dent. I glanced at the basement store, snug in the frame. There was more soft weeping in the basement. A voice croaked. Open up to him. Help me. I had to get out of this house. I had no choice. I was turned around, ready to bolt outside, when I caught sight of my phone, still laying on the table. The screen was lit up with a faint buzzing. Running forward, I snatched it up and checked the message. Crimson alert still in effect. Don't believe anyone saying otherwise. If you can read this, listen. The police can't help you. The military can't help you. Trust nothing that claims to be them. We had no time to prepare. I'm sending this out to everyone I can while I can. He is coming. Et diablos incarnate est. Et homo factus est. Someone let him in. 
Someone's opening the door. If you find them, kill them. And for the love of God, don't j The message cut off right there, just like the emergency broadcast. I could still hear that vaguely feminine voice becoming like shredded stones, pounding against the door. Another thud from the basement, followed by a bubbling croak. Then a window broke upstairs, followed by a light thud on the floor. A mix of tapping sounds followed, racing across the floor. I thought of Jenny, her smile, her natural tan skin, her eyes such a majestic blue, the same color as the sky, her laugh, her amazing spirit. She needed me. I had to find her. I'd never be able to live with myself if I didn't. I'd probably die, but it was worth the risk. Don't worry, babe, I said softly as I held up my baseball bat, going into the kitchen for a knife. Once I finished carving the cross onto the bat, I hefted it over my shoulder, trying to steal my nerves. I'm coming for you. Chapter 3 As the thing upstairs scuttled out of my room, the thing in the basement began thumping back up to the door. The large imposing voice was accompanying it, croaking with every word. P plus, kill me. The first thing I did was prop a chair under the handle of the basement door. Then the scuttling thing reached the stairs. I rushed around to the front room, bat raised and ready. The thing on the stairs froze when I saw it. Dried pieces of skin hung from its body. Eight legs, each one bent backward, propped itself up on a cricket-like body. Spiked raced up and down its carapace, with no pattern or symmetry. On its head was a dull, gray face with lifeless eyes. When its mouth opened, it chirped melodiously. One moment I could see it on the stairs. The next there was a sharp pain in my thigh, and I glanced down to see a large red spot on my pant leg. The thing's leg embedded in it. I swung my bat down at it, and then I was on my back. The air knocked out from my lungs, bat laying useless on the ground from me. The thing in human flesh was standing in front of me, head tilting to the side like it was curious. I held up my rosary, and as I did, its leg shot out, knocking it out of my hand and cutting my finger. Shit, I cursed, when its leg slammed into my chest. I groaned as I felt it begin dragging me. I was directly under its face, or rather, the mask it wore, when it began sniffing. Then it grunted. Patrick's coven, it hissed, in a voice that sounded like a razor blade pressed gently against my eye. How quaint. Should have listened to the warning, little mongrel. Don't trust your senses. Those words barely registered before I felt something on the back of my head. I raised a hand to it as the thing above me watched. When it came back, it was covered in blood and blonde hair. I slowly turned around, unable to help myself. There just behind me was the head of a woman, one I knew very well. Her sky blue eyes that I loved so much were gone. In its place were two slabs of pink meat. Her tongue, I realized. No, I said slowly. No. Yes. The thing above me hissed. Yes, your eyes do not deceive you this time. But, if I may be so bold, notice this. Its foreleg raised upward, pointing at the top of her dented head. Small opening here. Looks like someone cracked her skull open. Now direct your attention, it continued, to your weapon. I did. The baseball bat was covered in blood. Pieces of pink flesh and blonde hair. Oh, God. I croaked, shaking my head. No. I, Jenny, no. Silly human. It hissed again. Silly, silly human. Do you know what a crimson alert means? It means God has abandoned you and everyone else in this town. Oh, well. Such is due to all sinners. Time for you to die. I felt its head above mine, the lower part of the mass splitting open as a wet, slithering slab came out. It was covered in hairy spines and segmented like a caterpillar. On each segment was a face, screaming, writhing in agony. 
the one directly in front of me was an exact replica of its shredded mask. I do so love a crimson alert. Then there was a creak of wood. It paused. Then its tongue drew back suddenly, and it scuffled off of me, raising up on its hind legs. Hissing, its head turned to face the door on the patio. I stumbled backward, uncaring if I collided with Jenny's head. When I didn't, I looked behind me to find it gone. I gasped, looking around for it. Jenny? I cried out, pushing my hands along the cream carpet. Jenny! Calm yourself, said a deep, rumbling voice. Little man. I spun around to find a man standing there. He was tall, at least six feet in height, and impressively built. His chest and upper body were bare, revealing several scars across his tan abdomen. A black beard covered the lower half of his face, and his forehead was wrapped in a white cloth. When I saw his brown eyes, I was struck by how sad they were as he regarded me. Then they turned to the thing in human skin, and narrowed. What are you doing here? It hissed. You of all humans dare interfere and be quiet, Beezlebub. The man spat, his contempt piercing through his words. Your lies are not welcome here. I am not Beezlebub. The thing spat back, taking a step back as the man exited the doorframe. Don't call me by that bastard's name, Wanderer. You know who I am. S Do not, the man growled. Do not dare say that name. Or I'll swear when I send you back to hell. You'll be left wondering if you're truly safe there. The thing recoiled, its forelegs raised, not as a threat of attack, but as a meager defense. The remains of the mass swiveled from the man to me, then back again, before it hissed and fell back on all eight legs. It then bolted for the front door, smashing it down and disappearing into the night. I stood up, ran to the door, trying to see, then gasped shocked to find a body underneath the shattered door. It wore the uniform of a police officer, but the face had been ripped off, revealing the muscle underneath and two empty eye sockets. Then the mouth slowly moved. Pull, is, said the thing from the basement. The body in front of me synced with it perfectly. Kill me. Your wish is granted, said the man who had just saved my life. Before I knew what was happening, he shoved me out of the way, reached down, grabbed the man's head, and twisted, resulting in an ugly snap. A sigh echoed from the basement. The man turned to me. I advise you to stay indoors until this is all over. Tonight is a rather violent night. What? What's even happening? He raised an eyebrow. You've never heard of a crimson alert. I shook my head. He sighed, rubbing his forehead. When he spoke, his annoyance stung. I'm not entirely surprised, but I had been hoping at least a few people knew. Crimson alerts are rare, survivors even rarer. No one ever believes their stories. What is a crimson alert? I said again. In short, hell on earth. The man turned around to leave. My girlfriend, I said, making him stop. She's somewhere out there. At least, uh, I, I saw her. He showed you a vision of her, didn't he? The man said. I couldn't help shaking as I nodded. Ah, that is Moloch's hobby. He does so enjoy that. Moloch? I replied. Isn't that the demon in the- I would think by now you'd understand what is going on. You're luckier than most. Had I not been here, Moloch doubtless would have added you to his tongue, as he did this one. He pointed at the body before him. Look, I'm an atheist. I- I used to believe, but... But what? Well, if there is a god, he knows everything that's going to happen, right? Then why does he let bad things happen? The man rolled his eyes, sighing. I am not having this conversation right now. I must go. There is someone out there I need to kill. Then my phone buzzed. I quickly pulled it out of my pocket. Hey, I said, listen to this. What? The man said, his patience clearly thin. <clears throat> Clearing my voice, I recited the message. The Crimson Alert is still in effect. If you are reading this, I can confirm that the presence of the US Armed Forces in the Lower East Side is real. Forget what I said about them not being able to help you. Go to them. They'll get you out of here. When I finished, I looked at the man. Do you believe that? He asked. 
I hesitated. That was all he needed. I doubt the initial broadcast told you everything. A crimson alert never does. All they say is there's no time to prepare or explain. Those instructions? Placebos. Just a little something to make you think there's a chance. What? <laughs> he laughed, but he wasn't amused. The only part you should trust is not trust your senses. I don't have more time to waste. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to kill a man. Wait! I said, but he ignored me, stepping over the body and then into the night. As he left, I stuck my head out of the door and was hit by the scent of rotting flesh, burned pork, sulfur, and goat musk. Then there was another buzz from my phone. I immediately checked it out. My heart practically skipped a beat when I saw it. It was Jenny. She'd sent me a picture. Her clothes had been almost torn to pieces. Whatever remained didn't do a good job of hiding her exposed body. Her face was covered in tears and her skin covered in mud, pieces of grass, and small white flowers. Her forehead was bleeding, blood seeping into one eye. Worst of all was that she wasn't in her house. She was laying on a concrete floor, looking up at the camera, her face clearly pleading with whoever had taken this picture. Accompanying it was a message. Don't j- Don't j- Don't j- I didn't finish reading it before I picked up my baseball bat, then sent a text back. Who the fuck are you? It took only a moment for them to respond. Oh, you're not dead? Odd. Last public announcement said everyone was dead. Look, I know what this looks like, but trust me, I can explain. Here, follow this map. Your girlfriend's alright for now anyway, but we need help, like right fucking now. So don't be a cunt and get over here. You're not safe in your house or anywhere else, except outside this goddamn town. So you coming? I paused, not having expected this, when a picture of Google Map, a trail marked in blue leading to the town center, appeared next. It took me only a moment to respond. How can I trust you? The response was another picture. This time, it was of Jenny, sleeping underneath a grey wool blanket, a blue pillow under her head. You can't. We both know that. I'm already taking a giant fucking risk, asking a cunt like you to come. But hey, this is a nightmare, and if we don't help each other, no one's getting out of here alive. So you coming, or what? I tapped a message back instantly. Yes. I grabbed my rosary. Then, bracing myself for both the smell and whatever else I found, I stepped over the dead body into the burning nightmare that was my town. Chapter 4 Chaos. That was what I found when I left my house. Chaos. There weren't burning cars or dead bodies littering the streets. Instead, Numerous smoldering piles of ash were scattered around me. On one, there was nestled a pair of cracked spectacles, waiting for someone to pick them up. In another was a pair of small sneakers with the Superman shield on the side. It was impossible not to look indirectly at the sky as I walked through the streets, and what I glimpsed up there were scars, for lack of a better word. Scars in the sky. In those scars were... were... Nothing. I mean, literally nothing. Absolutely nothing. Even seeing it in my peripheral vision, I felt like I would go mad just trying to comprehend what was on the other side of those scars. I looked away, but sometimes it felt like those scars were staring at me. No, not the scars. Something on the other side of the scars. In the... in the nothing. And it hated me. How had I not heard any of this? Ah yes, mustn't trust my senses. Could that demonic creature, Moloch, my gruff savior had called him, have prevented me from hearing this? Had it been tormenting me from the moment I saw that face outside my window? Probably. I clutched the rosary tighter in my hands. Stepping around each pile of ash, I averted my eyes from each one, wondering if they had been someone I knew before the crimson alert started. Friends, neighbors, mere acquaintances. Now and then, I'd glimpse something in a pile that gave me a clue. Mrs. Perkins, the old lady down the road. 
In one pile were her favorite earrings. In another was a baseball bat that was scorched black. But it didn't hide the growling bulldog young Timothy loved to tell me about. He was, uh, had been such an artistic kid. A gust of wind suddenly blew one pile into my face. <coughs> I coughed as hot ashes burned me and wafted into my nose, brushing them off my face and skin, rubbing my eyes. When I heard a footstep nearby, I paused and glanced over, then raised the baseball bat over my head. Mickey Mouse was staring right at me. He was missing a plastic ear and part of his face, and his friendly grin was covered in ash, blood, and what looked like bread. Below him was a human body, dressed in a menagerie of colors that made him look like a clown. A clown holding a rusty axe. Thick globs of blood dripped from the blade. Have, said an infantile voice from underneath the mask. Have you seen my shoe? I need my shoe. He was wearing two mismatched boots. When they began to move, I took a step back, my foot landing on the edge of an ash pile. I need my shoe, the infantile voice said again. Mommy's going to be mad with me if I don't find my shoe. Um, I said, my eyes darting around the street, trying to think of anything I could do to avoid my blood ending up on the rusty blade. Then I pointed in a random direction. There, I saw your shoe over there. Mickey Mouse turned around, following my finger. His chest rose and fell with each heavy breath he took, and from this angle, I could make out the bald, crinkled, yellow patches of skin in his hair. As he turned back, I braced for his answer. Oh, he said slowly, are you sure? Absolutely, yes, 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 I said, nodding furiously. Quite sure. Thank you, Mickey answered, <laughs> then giggled before turning in that direction and taking slow, shuffling steps. A song came from under the mask. There was a man who had a dog, and Bingo was his name, B-I-N-G-O. I didn't wait for him to finish, and instead booked it, skirting or leaping around each ash pile. My face still stung from the pile which had blown into my face. I wondered who it had been, then shook my head of the curiosity. When I rounded the corner of the old chicken place, I ducked back around instantly before peering out again. Just at the end of the street, I could see the unmistakable form of a tank slowly moving towards me. The turret moved from side to side, the barrel like a dog's nose, sniffing for prey. When its treads crunched over a car, one of the headlights briefly flashed on before they were sucked in revealing crimson stains on the tracks. Then the tank stopped and the barrel slowly turned towards me. I froze when it lowered sharply, down its empty, basking cannon. Something was staring at me. I waited for it to fire. But instead, the tank turned away, barrel raising into the sky before it fired. The blast alone almost burst my eardrums and sent me staggering onto my back. As I moved back into a sitting position, I could hear the tank suddenly burst into life and rocket forward, rushing past me and plowing several cars out of the way, the barrel still trained at the sky. I got a text message afterwards. Okay, stranger, don't mind me, but there's a small problem. What? I texted back, emptying my contempt into a single word. Well, it's your girlfriend, Jenny. See, something's chasing her. She said it was like a goat man mixed with a bird. And after all the crazy shit that's happened, I believe it. Now, I assumed it wouldn't find her, but, well, I just looked outside. It's not out outside our hiding place per se, but it was. Look, I don't know where it went, but it was carrying a dead dog in its talons, hands, claws, I don't know. I don't know what to call them. And if I'm not mistaken, that dog was sniffing the ground, a dead dog, trying to find a scent. Not the craziest thing I've seen tonight, but it's up there. What am I supposed to do? I texted back. Kill it, obviously. I haven't seen it since it passed by, but it's out there somewhere. And I'm sure it'll find us eventually. So if you see that son of a bitch, using a dead dog as a guide, acting like it's a top shit, you kill that motherfucker and you make it hurt, okay? 
Okay. I do it myself, but one, I don't have a weapon. And two, someone has to take care of Jenny here. And three, most importantly, like fucking hell, I'm going outside. I growled in my throat before texting back. Fine, but I'm only doing this for Jenny. Ah, young love, was the reply. Such a beautiful thing. And that, by the way, was sarcasm, if you couldn't tell. I stood up and resumed following the trail on the Google map, ducking in and out of cover. I was hiding behind the crumpled remains of a car when I heard it. There was a farmer who had a dog, and Bingo was his name, oh, B-I-N-G-O. I can't find my shoe. Mommy's gonna hurt me. Shit. When I looked behind me, the figure down the street was dragging something along the ground, its blade glinting in the dim glow. The round black circle sticking out from the top of the head was swiveling from side to side, slowly, like a shark's fin floating through the water. A clatter of hooves and sharp beating of wings from the other side of the car made me start and peer around the edge cautiously. This side of the street wasn't as well lit as the one Mickey Mouse was in, but in the shadows. I could make out the faint image of a dog's head pressed against the ground, the nose twitching every now and then. There was no glinting in its eyes. Valak, hissed the voice, the one which sounded like a razor blade across the eyeball. There is a problem. The dog's head stopped moving. There was a low rumbling growl as the shadow seemed to part and shift. A beak cracked down the middle, emerged along with two yellow eyes, rectangular pupils glaring at something off to the side. What? A stilted, croaking voice said, one that bore evidence of disuse. Is it? A scuttling nearby before a thing in a woman's face emerged from the shadows, confirmed who the new guest was. The wandering Jew is here. Moloch hissed, mass perfectly still, and he's hunting the Agagite. The big didn't move as Valak answered. You are sure of this? Yes. Moloch hissed back. I saw him of my own eyes, and barely escaped with my shell intact. And if he's here, it's for one reason only, to hunt down the Agagite. Humans, Velikist, carry strong grudges. Moloch snorted. True, true, but this will interfere with Hela's arrival. We must find some way to remove the mark bearer from here, or... When Moloch paused, I could see Valak shifting uncomfortably. I'm not going back. He croaked, not to the emptiness. Then he paused, his beak swiveling down the street. Slowly it opened, breaking apart as a black lump poked out of it. A gleaming yellow goat's eye was on the other end. The singing behind me had gotten louder. What? Valak said, eyes shifting between shades of yellow. Is that? Moloch's mass suddenly turned, following Valak's eye. Ah, he hissed. Interesting. This human, he's gone insane. Not unique, certainly. Then, why do I smell something on him? Moloch's mask twitched. Now that you mention it, there is a faint aroma about him, like sulfur. No, 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 not sulfur. Close, though. I'd keep an eye on that one. Perhaps he could be useful. I can't, Valak answered. I hunt, ah. Uh. Mate, Moloch finished. Ah yes, how quaint. Tell me, what does he look like? Valak's eyes turned towards Moloch, but before he answered, Moloch chuckled. Ha 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 ha, I already know. You really need to hide your desires better, dear brother. Come to think of it, that girl was in a relationship with one of my victims. Well, would be victim, before the mark bearer stopped me. If you find her, please make it extra fucking painful. And bring me the body. Vala growled. No promises, brother. Moloch just grunted and scurried away. Valak's eyes turned back down the street at Mickey Mouse. Then he fully emerged from the shadows, revealing a massive lean shape with two sickly wings covered in fur, and feathers protruding from the back. His hands were a strange mixture of a man's, a crow's talons, and the hooves of a goat. As he advanced steadily towards Mickey Mouse, the dead dog in his hand suddenly twitched, 
and he stopped. Oh? Malak's eye turned to the car I was hiding behind. Then the pupil narrowed on me. Patrick's convert. I didn't even wait before I screamed and charged out from behind the car, holding up the bat and swinging it with all my might. Unlike Moloch, Valak just remained still, his three eyes taking on an unmistakable mocking twinkle, until the baseball bat connected with his beak. Valak staggered back, screeching in that disused voice. The rectangular pupils of his eyes turned to me, bewildered. How? He didn't get to recover as I brought the bat down on his head, smashing it against him over and over. Stay away from Jenny. When I drew up the bat again, I could feel something oozing down it, but I didn't care, just swinging it down on Valak's tongue. When it connected with the eye, it burst and Valak screamed. His wings suddenly beat fiercely, sending me back as he pushed away, landing on the ground a good distance from me. His tongue was a fountain of blood as he glared at me with his remaining eye. His beak now cracked and oozing some yellow liquid. Where I'd struck him, several burn marks shaped like a crucifix scarred his head. He drew his tongue back in, readied his hands, then stopped. He took a step back and the edges of his beak twisted into a smirk. Hey! said an infantile voice from behind me. Where's my shoe? Chapter 5 The heavy breathing behind me, combined with Valak's arrogant smirk, made me want to break and run for it. Obviously I couldn't, not without forfeiting my life. I need, Mickey said behind me, to find my shoe. Please help me. Before I could say anything else, Valak did. He has your shoe. He pointed a finger at me, made of a crow's talon and cloven goat hoof. What? Mickey said, and his axe was dragged across the concrete road. I turned sharply to see him staring at me. Can I have my shoe? I don't have it, I swear. I said, pointing back at Valak. He's lying. <laughs> Valak chuckled. Give me my shoe, Mickey pleaded. Please. He lifted the axe up off the ground and into his other hand. That thing has it, I said, jabbing a finger at Valak. He's got your shoe. Mickey didn't so much as glance at him. His grip on the axe just tightened as his mismatched boots came towards me. When I saw the droplets of blood fly off the blade, I raised up my bat to block the incoming strike. It was knocked out of my hand easily, splintered into two pieces. Before I could do anything else, I felt a sharp pain as something collided with my side, and I was launched through the air, impacting on someone's lawn. I grunted, my already injured finger now bent horribly as a rib moved with a life of its own. Give the boy his shoe. Valak said, slowly stalking towards me, beak still licking yellow liquid. I held up my rosary and he stopped, then chuckled as Mickey walked past him, shaking his head as his black, rectangular pupils focused on the axe-wielding madman. Shit, I thought, getting to my feet and breaking into a sprint. My shoe! Mickey whined, his boots racing after me. Give me my shoe! The beating of wings made me glance over my shoulder in time to see Valak rising into the air, his arms spread outward, gnarled fingers curling inward. Then there was an explosion as a dark cloud erupted from him, and he fell from the sky with a howl of rage. Mickey stopped and turned around, his head tilting to the side. The rumbling of treads followed by another shot that deafened my eardrums let me know who my savior was. Valak was still trying to right himself as a shell impacted on his body and screamed in rage at this. He began flying again, swerving to avoid being hit as several tracer rounds flew through the air, shredding into his wings. I took my chance. Bending down, I took off my shoe and held it over my head. Hey! I called out to Mickey. He turned back to me. Here's your shoe. Go get it. I threw it as far as I could, then sprinted again. Mickey's boots moved, stamping against the ground, but they quickly faded. As I tried to find my way to wherever Jenny was, 
I tried repeating to myself what I shouldn't do. Don't trust your senses. Don't trust your senses. Don't trust your senses. Did that mean? Could all of this be a lie? What if I was lying somewhere, bleeding out, imagining all of this as some thing, got its shits and giggles out of it? What if it hadn't been Jenny who called me? What if she was dead? Good God, was she dead? I took out my phone, scrolling through my texts, when I noticed something. The message from whoever had Jenny, the one with the picture of her being alright. The picture was still there, but the message was gone. What the fuck? I said softly to myself, before trying to text Jenny again. Hey, how do I know this is Jenny? The answer was instantaneous. Well, well, now he asks a question. You're not as stupid as I thought, cunt. You don't obviously, but you don't have much of a lead on finding her, do you? I can't trust my senses, can I? I type back. How do I know for sure any of this is real? I feel the same way, mate. The other person typed back. I really do. Fuck, man. I keep wondering if everything I've seen is real or some kind of fucking joke. You ever hear of Lovecraft? Poe? Both writers dealt with people going fucking nuts. Right now, I feel like they're writing this story and we're caught up in it. I was about to type something else when Jenny called out to me. Baby! I spun around and there she was. She was wearing a pair of ripped shorts which ended just at her thighs and a black tank top. I blinked, shocked, and stumbled forward. Jenny? I said, amazed to see her again. Jenny, is that you? Baby, it's me! She said, tears running down her face as she sprinted towards me. I held my arms open to her. Don't trust your senses, lad. My granddad's warning made me stop and back away. Jenny stopped running. Baby, what's wrong? How do I know it's you? What? You remember what the Crimson Alert said. Don't trust your senses. How do I know you're real? Jenny's sobs broke my heart, but she remained still. I... I don't know, baby. Oh, God. Then her face brightened. Are, are you... are you real, Anthony? My name's not Anthony, I said slowly backing away. Jenny's eyes widened. I didn't say that, she cried, holding out a hand. I swear I didn't call you Anthony. I heard you. I called back, but my granddad's warning was still fresh in my mind. What if she hadn't called me Anthony, but I just heard that? Shit, shit, shit. How was I supposed to know? Oh, God. Jenny said, her lip quivering as sobs continued to escape her throat. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. What are we supposed to do? Wait. I said, holding up a rosary. I... I tried this earlier, with a shovel. If I touch you with this, maybe... Maybe it'll let us know. Jenny stared at the rosary in my hands, then nodded. Okay, okay. You just... Just put it in my hands. She held them out in front of her, cupped together. I took tentative steps towards her. Might be a trick, my granddad said. Don't give this away too easily. I gripped my beads in my hand and slowly began to lower the cross into her palms. Jenny's sky blue eyes stared at me, tears running down her face. Then her hand snapped back and she stepped away. No, she said, shaking her head. No, this has to be a trick. I stepped back as well. What do you mean? It's a trick, she said again. It has to be a trick. This is too good to be true. It can't be real. I continued stepping away from Jenny, as she did the same to me. Then, without warning, she turned away and sprinted into a run. Jenny! I called, almost about to run after her, then paused, unable to make up my mind. This might not be the real Jenny. Why hadn't she let me put the rosary in her hands? She's scared, my granddad said, but not of the rosary. I solemnly swallowed, then sighed, continuing on my way to find the real Jenny. Hopefully, she hadn't just run off into the night. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Tears ran down my face as I burst into a run, despite my lungs protesting. I kept dodging piles of ash, broken cars, lamps unended, and kept my eyes on the Google map on my phone. I was just about to turn a corner when I heard a spatter of gunshots punctuated by the brief screaming of children. 
than nothing. I paused, more out of shock, and I was about to resume running when I heard a click behind me. Hands up, someone said. Turn around. I did as I was instructed, and found myself facing a squad of soldiers, peering at me through dark visors. There were about ten of them in total, each one with a gun trained on me. What's that in your hand? One said, gesturing to my rosary. A rosary? I answered truthfully. It's just a rosary. Two of the soldiers exchanged glances with each other, before turning to the one directly in the middle of them. Where had these men come from? Were they just an illusion, or... Or had something kept me from hearing them? On your knees. One said, stepping forward. Now. I did as was told, putting my hands behind my head. Hold up, the same one said. Hand it over. What? I said. The rosary, give it here. No, I said. No, I need this. Not for much longer, one of them muttered. I glanced toward him, eyes wide. Then I turned back to the one still approaching me. The barrel of his gun was pointed right between my eyes. Sorry about this, he said, sighing. But orders are orders. A finger on the trigger began to squeeze slowly. No, don't! I said, stumbling back and holding out a hand. Then it happened. A massive form descended from above, smashing into the man and turning him into a bloody puddle on the ground. Shit! The others cried, pointing at the newcomer as they rose to full height. This was unmistakably a demon. His head was a dragon's, two massive horns like a rhino's protruding from his head while elephant tusks stuck out of his cheeks. A serpent's tail slid behind his furry legs. Wait, that wasn't fur. Those were small, miniature tentacles. Not like an octopus or a squid, but tentacles all the same. The body was almost completely human, but the skin was a mixture of blue, red, black, and gold in varying shades. In one hand, he held a glaive. Snarling, two dog-like eyes glared at me before turning to the soldiers. Fire! One cried, and they did so. The demon roared and began swinging his glaive, slashing one in two before swiping his tail and decapitating another. He flew back up into the air, then shot back down, smashing through three of them in explosions of blood and gore. A head rolled past me, eyes wide in shock and horror. The remaining four were backing away, still firing, when something lunged out from the darkness and tore one of their heads off. Two more did the same, snarling and roaring like mad dogs. The last one dropped his weapon, fell to his knees, and held up his hands in a plea as a demon slowly approached him. This, this wasn't part of the deal. What the fuck, man? What the fuck? He said you wouldn't hurt us. Just come on, leave me alive, please. I've got a family, a girlfriend. The demon pointed his glaive at me, as the things which were eating the other three slunk around him on hands and feet. My first thought was werewolves, but their eyes were blazing red and flames came out of their nostrils when they snorted. Does this one have a female he cares for? What? I said. Do you have a female you care for? The demon repeated. Yes, I answered, nodding my head furiously. Yes, I've got a family as well, a mom and dad. The demon snorted before turning back to the soldier. Disgusting. You turn on your own so quickly, and then beg for your life like a whimpering rat. The reasons you dare give for your life to be spared apply to him as well. He gestured at me briefly. Do not think I will listen to your pleas, coward. Beezlebub, lord of the hunt, does not tolerate such nonsense. Then he grunted, and the slinking wolfman around his feet lunged forward. The soldier only screamed briefly before they tore him to shreds. Then, with blood-covered snots, they turned to me and began stalking forward, snarling hungrily. Then Beezlebub whistled. Come, he said, taking to the sky. This one is not worth the hunt. We have other trophies to find. The creatures paused, looked upward as Beezebub began to fly off into the night, then followed after only a moment. I lay on the ground, still panting, before getting back on my feet slowly, 
kicking off my other shoe and holding it into my hand. Then I paused and turned to one of the guns laying around me. I had no experience shooting these kinds of things and would probably do more harm to myself than an enemy. But I could take something. Two combat knives and a single pistol, along with some ammo, were enough for me, and I continued running, searching for Jenny and her caretaker. Chapter 6 Even though I was armed with something stronger than a baseball bat, I couldn't stop feeling uneasy. I'd almost been killed by American soldiers, and my life had been saved by a demon. This was absolutely insane. What was I supposed to do now? Had those actually been soldiers, or just something else pretending to be them? If so, why had the demon, Beezlebub, saved me? Had it... had it been a trick? Nah, Grandad said in my head. Fallen angels may be some of the most disgusting and loathsome creatures in God's creation, but at least a few of them have some decency. Some, mind you. Thanks for the advice, Grandad, I muttered. Do you remember some of the stories I used to tell you? Like how I know what the devil's footprints look like. I paused and nodded slowly. Yes, of course, I knew that story. Dad had always dismissed it as just nonsense, but I still listened. I only stopped believing when I got older. It had been one Christmas, the year after Grandad told me what the devil's footprints were. We just had dinner, and Grandad was telling me a story before bed. It was about two giants who built a causeway from Ireland to Scotland so they could have a fight. When one tricked the other, the loser tore up the bridge. Tell me another, Grandad, I said, the eager little boy that I was. A scary one. Scary story my granddad said, raising one eyebrow. On Christmas. I nodded, still smiling. Granddad sighed, looked out of the window at the Michigan night, then turned back to me. Okay, I've got a good one, and this is a true story. I sat up in my bed, eyes wide with excitement. Granddad didn't open his mouth, remaining as still as a statue, a far away haunted look in his eyes. Then he spoke. When I was a young lad, just turned 18, I got into the habit of playing cards. At the time, I was living in Belfast, and it was a dangerous time to be there. Black and tans roamed the streets. Unionists would shoot Catholics. Nationalists bombed pubs. Aye, it was a dangerous time. I was in one of the pubs with my friends, drinking, cursing, and gaining or losing money with every hand of cards we played. It was a good crate until a stranger approached us. He was tall and handsome, with dark hair and dark eyes. But when I looked into them, a feeling of dread entered my soul. He asked to join our game, so we led him, and oh, how he played. He was a master of the game, seeming to know exactly what was in our hands before we even saw them. More than one of my friends accused the stranger of cheating, and the stranger just laughed. Still, as good as he was, I knew what I was doing as well. I was the first one who managed to call a bluff of his and take some of his cash. And when I dragged those pound notes and coins towards me, I felt a shiver go up my spine. I looked up. The stranger was staring right at me with those dark eyes. There was this look in them, like a wolf eyeing a lamb. Then he nodded at me with a friendly smirk, like he was challenging me. So I nodded back. Pretty soon it was clear he had it out for me. He ignored my mates, and when he did pay attention to them, he'd rob them blind with a few plays. Pretty soon, none of my friends could keep playing, leaving me and the stranger alone. Then he spoke. He said, Let's make this more exciting. How about this time we bet something aside from our money? So I asked him what we could bet. He laughed and answered. Like he was a kid telling an innocent joke. Your soul. The pub went quiet when he said that. And I don't mean everyone stopped talking. I mean completely quiet. Not even a mouse dared make a sound. And the floorboards wouldn't creak. 
It was so silent, I would have thought we were all dead. And this stranger was smiling, with a wicked look in his eyes. I think at that moment, me and my mates realized who we had been playing with. Like I told you, I was young, and like all young men, stupid. So I smirked and decided to raise the stakes a bit more. All right, I told the stranger. I'll accept your bet, but on one condition. If I win, you have to leave the earth. <laughs> the stranger laughed and stuck out his hand as smoothly as a snake uncoiling. I didn't shake it, only looked back at him and nodded. That was the most intense game of my life. I was sweating like a waterfall while the stranger just coolly shuffled his cards across his fingers, licking his lips every now and then. My friend had shuffled the deck and dealt our hands, and he was sweating more than I was. When I saw the stranger smile at me with a wicked grin, I at first thought for sure I'd lost and wouldn't have long on this earth, until his eyes, ever so briefly, clouded with doubt. It was so quick, I would have missed it if I hadn't have been paying attention. I looked at my own hands, it must have been a miracle from God because, for the first time in my life, I had four aces. We played our hands. When the stranger played his, it was four aces. He laughed aloud until I played mine. His laughter vanished and those aces changed into a king, a queen, an eight of spades, and a one. I smirked at him, stood up from my seat, jabbed a finger at the door and said, Get out. Only the stranger didn't. He sat there, body shaking with rage, eyes clouding over. They were changing, shimmering before me like feathers on a crow. You, he said, hissing in a way which would freeze a snake's blood. Cheated. Then I did something really stupid. Nah, I told him. You just had the misfortune of playing against a lucky Irishman. He didn't roar and scream. No. He did something far worse. He slowly stood up from his chair, placed both hands calmly on the table, leaned toward, and hissed through clenched teeth. I never lose, he spat. Never. Not to some ruddy little bastard from Patrick's coven. You'll rue the day you did this to me. You'll know one day what it means to cross my path. When your body is dead and six feet under, I'll have my vengeance. Then he turned around, walking towards the door with heavy steps that could have shattered the floor if he wanted to. When he reached it, he turned around, still snarling at me, with teeth that had become sharp and jagged. Not like any animal on this earth. They were like needles, twisted and bent, easily able to rip the flesh from my bones. Then he opened the door, and on the other side, there was nothing. I do mean nothing, lad. There wasn't a road, no rainy weather, no blustering Ulster wind. Not even fire and brimstone. Just nothing. I could have gone mad looking at it. Then the stranger crossed over the threshold, slamming the door shut behind him. And I saw his footprints burn into the floorboards. You remember when I drew you the devil's footprint? I nodded at Grandad's question. Aye, he said slowly. That's how I know what they look like. When I came back to the present, I could feel something looking at me, with the same hatred as from the scars. I almost turned around to check, but I already knew where it was coming from. So I kept walking, trying to ignore as it followed my every step. It was when I reached the end of the trail that I saw it. A meeting house of some kind. One you could mistake for a church were it not for the sign out front. I smiled, relieved, and began walking towards it when I got another buzz from my phone. I pulled it out, checked, and what I saw made my stomach drop. It was a message. Jenny's gone. I answered back instantly. What do you mean she's gone? I took my eyes off her for one second and she's gone. Just gone. Like she disappeared into thin air. I gave her some clothes to change into and then poof, she's gone. I don't know where she went, but look, I'm sorry. I meant what I said earlier. If we don't work together, we won't make it out of this alive. One part of that message in particular caught my eye, and I responded with it in mind. Did, did you give her a tank top and shorts? Yes, 
How do you know that? Shit. I cried out loud, looking back the way it had come. God damn it, god damn it all! I typed back another message on the spot. I'm outside the meeting hall. Where are you? Inside. And I think I can see you. Are you the guy with two knives looking at his phone? Not if so. I did nod. The next message was a bit more urgent. Okay, good. But before we can find your girl, there's a problem. Do you see anything around you? Like a person? I shook my head in response, knowing they could see me. Okay, uh, look. I do. They... They've got too many arms and eyes. Okay, but listen. I can only see them through the window. I poked my head out of the door earlier, and they were gone. But then I checked the window again, and they hadn't moved. So listen closely, okay? I'll guide you here, and we'll be able to find Jenny after. I swallowed and answered in the affirmative. Okay, okay. Take ten steps forward, then stop. There's one right behind you. Don't freak out or anything. It's not looking at you, I think. So, just don't look behind you. Don't do anything that might get its attention. I began walking, counting each step until I reached ten. Great, great, now. There's... Oh shit, one's moving. I can see one moving on your right. Take about five steps to the left now, then go nine steps forward. The moment they typed that, I heard the crunching of grass from my right. Then saw some small pieces of gravel kick themselves across the floor. I counted each step again, before taking the nine steps forward. When I stopped, I checked the phone again. Shit, another's moving now. This one's right in front of you, about six steps away. There's another to your left, so go right in a diagonal. I did as instructed, ignoring the shuffling sound just in front of me. I was close enough to the meeting hall now to see a face in one of the windows. Then a hand appeared, palm facing me. I stopped. Can you see me? Of course you can. You're looking right at me. Look, there's about five right in front of you, spread out unevenly. The other two are following after. So here's what you need to do. See that fire hydrant? Go towards it. But don't go straight. Make a circle. The fire hydrant in question was about ten feet on the pavement to my left. And I began moving towards it, stopping the moment I reached a yellow object. Okay, now keep going straight. But in about 10 steps, make a sharp turn to your right and then just run. I was following their instructions, having just reached 10 steps when they sent another message. Go back, go back right the fuck now. I did, walking backward, a few good steps until they told me to stop. I glanced at the face in the window, unable to make out any features. The next message was short, sweet, and simple. Get onto the road, jump over that lamp, then run for the door. Just run! I didn't even need to check twice before doing as they said. Once I vaulted over the lamp, there was a metallic clang behind me as my feet hit the ground, and I broke into a run. I was within a few steps of the door when it happened. The face from the window appearing from it. They were a girl with dark black hair, mouth open and eyes wide as I ran up the steps and pushed past them, slamming the door shut behind me. I couldn't stop breathing, my lungs sore, my broken rib moving slowly against the others, my finger burning with pain. I sighed, then collapsed onto my back, and almost closed my eyes until someone slapped me awake. It was a girl with black hair. Hey, buddy, stay awake, come on, I've got medical supplies in the back, now move! I stood up as they briskly began walking between the rows of seats, with a kind of confidence I envied. I was walking after them when a thought occurred to me. I don't know your name, I called hoarsely. What is it? They turned back, then sighed. Rosie, she said. Just call me Rosie. I already know yours, Sean. Now, my name's not Sean. Rosie froze, narrowing her eyes at me. I didn't call you Sean. You just did, I answered, gripping my knives. I heard you. Rosie held up her hand. Whoa, just calm down. I'm telling the truth, I swear. Oh? I snarled. Where's Jenny? I don't know. You saw her last. Liar. I snapped, about to break into a run when I got a new message on my phone, and so did Rosie. I tentatively unlocked my phone, never taking my eyes off Rosie, as I checked the message. It was Jenny. Or at least someone using Jenny's phone. Because Jenny would never have sent this message. That bitch Rosie tried to rape and kill me, it said, 
She'll do it to you. I glanced back at Rosie, who was holding her phone in hands, with eyes wide. What, what did that message say? That you tried to rape and kill Jenny, I answered calmly, and will do the same to me. Well, Rosie answered, I can assure you I didn't try to do any of that. And my message says you aren't Jenny's boyfriend, and that, well, that you're going to rape and kill me. The silence stretching between us was like a panther waiting to strike. I glanced at my phone again, and the message from Jenny was gone. I looked back to Rosie, seeing the same expression in her eyes as was doubtless in mine. Then from outside, the silence was broken by pain screams and hoarse yelling as flesh and bone were torn apart. Blood splattered across the window, along with a thing, with too many eyes and arms. The moment it went quiet, I looked back to Rosie, shocked, until the door slammed open. When I turned around, the person standing there was instantly recognizable. The Mark Bearer, the wandering Hebrew, Cain. Chapter 3 Cain glared at us with a dour expression. He grunted and was about to turn away when I shouted at him. Hey, Cain! He spun around instantly, eyes narrowed. Oh? He said in that deep voice. You figured out who I am. How impressive. I'd expect Moloch made it obvious enough. Cain? Rosie said from behind me. You're... you're the Cain. You're the... First murderer. Cain interrupted somberly. Mark Bearer, wandering Hebrew. What I am not, sadly, is my brother's keeper. For a brief moment, I thought he would cry, but his face became like stone. I do hope you both survive the alert, but I have better things to do than watch children. I already told you. I know, there's someone you must kill. I overheard Valak and Moloch talking with each other, and said you would only be here if you were hunting the Agagite. Who is that? Cain's eyes widened then narrowed at me. Hmm, he said. You are indeed a lucky man. The Agagite they spoke of is Haman. Rosie inhaled sharply. Are you fucking kidding me? No, Cain said. Haman the Agagite lives, and has lived for over a thousand years, since before the birth of Christ or Mohammed. And he is the one responsible for all of this. Cain then focused on me with an intense, piercing stare. What else did Moloch and Valak say? They they mentioned someone called Hello and his arrival. What I saw next chilled me far more than anything since the Crimson Alert had started. Keynes inhaled sharply, looking like he'd had the wind knocked out of his lungs. His eyes were so wide they would have fallen out of his head. His mouth hung open numbly, revealing cavity-ridden teeth. Hello, he whispered, is coming. I nodded slowly, unable to understand anything save that whoever Hellel was, they were capable of scaring even Cain, the first murderer. Who's Hellel? Rosie asked, unable to hide the fearful curiosity in her voice. Hellel, Cain said slowly, is the source of all sin. He is the one who whispers into man's ears and shows them how to give in to their darker nature. He is the one who laughed when Christ was nailed to the cross, who delights in the little depravities of life. He oversees a father murdering his own daughter and rejoices. He sings songs of praise of every rape and torture ever committed. When the sky goes dark and children burn, Hella listens in bliss. Hella is a creature of spite who seeks to drag all life into a void of pure nothing, into which there can be no deliverance. Hillel is who you know as the devil. Cain's words sunk into me as well as Rosie. Neither of us dared move. Cain just stood there, a wild look in his eyes. No wonder Cain feared Hillel. If he is coming here, he continued, then this is no ordinary crimson alert. This is something more. You said Hillel is a devil. My granddad, he once beat the devil in a game of cards and sent him back to hell. Cain blinked, still not crossing the threshold. Then he relaxed and bitterly chuckled. Ah, he said, that's it. That's why he's coming. 
He pointed the finger at me. He's coming here. For you. What? I said stunned. Why? Hellel is, as I said, a creature of pure spite. He could not conquer heaven. So now he seeks one thing only. To spite God and all those he feels slighted by. To the utmost extreme. So, so all of this is because my granddad- This is a source of all sin we are talking about, Cain said. There is nothing that is beyond him. Hold up, hold up, Rosie said. You mentioned Haman the Agagite. How the fuck is he still alive? He was supposed to have been hanged before Christ was born. Cain glanced at her. Indeed, he should have been hanged. But, like the coward he is, Haman sought a way to save himself and found it. He struck a deal with the source of all sin before he died. In return for his life being saved, he could live a thousand years, one century, for each of his sons. His sons? I said blinking. Wait, he... He gave his own kids over to the devil. There is no low Haman would not stoop to, Cain said with a growl, to save his own damn skin. Now, however, he's out of sons, so Hillel comes to collect. He's clutching at straws. He needs to find some way to escape death and what waits beyond it. How do you know this? Rosie asked, flabbergasted. Cain laughed. I've been hunting the bastard for years. We've crossed paths many times throughout history. In the Crusades, the Thirty Year War, during the Napoleonic, and yes, he was indeed present when the Nazis rose to power. He was the one helping them set up the camps into which he threw my people. So, you're hunting him because he helped set up the Holocaust? Not just that, Cain answered Rosie. Haman has done far more than just that. The ground shook lightly unbalancing Rosie and myself. Kane remained stock still, but the surprise on his face was alarming. Oh no, he said under his breath before focusing on Rosie and I. You have to leave, now. Haman is close, so very close. How? I spat suddenly. How can we leave? You know what happened when I ran into a group of soldiers? They tried to kill me. The only reason I'm still alive is that freaking Beezlebub saved my ass. When a fucking demon has more concern for our lives than the soldiers meant to protect us, what the hell are we supposed to do? <sighs> ah, that explains it. That's how Haman has accomplished this. He chuckled bitterly, without a shred of mirth, before he resumed speaking. Listen, this building was a church once, but offers only meager protection from the monsters destroying this place. As you can see, the things in front of this building are all dead, but there will be more soon. Kane sighed again. I suppose you may follow me, but be warned. Follow me long enough and you will suffer a death second only to that of Christ. Rosie and I exchanged glances before looking back to Kane. We'll take that chance. Following Kane into the burning town I'd called home was not an experience I wanted to continue. Yes, he provided protection. But that didn't mean I wasn't aware of the danger. Anything could kill me at any moment, and I may never know it. Rosie was asking questions at Kane rapid fire, one after the other. He answered them sparingly, but the tension he radiated was infectious. The devil was coming here. For me. And that wasn't the only thing. Hey, I said slowly. What about the scars? Kane stopped suddenly and turned around. When he spoke, there was a defensive tone in his voice. What scars? In the sky. Kane's eyes widened, while Rosie gave me a strange look before glancing at the sky. There is nothing there, she said. What? I said. No, no, that can't be right. I can see them right... I was already turning around, pointing at one scar at random, as Kane suddenly stepped forward. Don't. Then everything exploded. When I woke up, I was lying in a bed, in a white room that I instantly realized was a hospital. I groaned and tried to move my hands, but found them bound by two leather straps. I blinked, and when I tried to move my leg, felt the leather biting into them. Help! I screamed, struggling and trying to break free. Someone help me! A door opened at my left, and I glanced at it. There was a man in a cyan shirt and pants staring at me amazed. 
Then he leaned back through the threshold. Hey, he's awake. A rushing of feet followed, before a person who was unmistakably a doctor entered the room. His eyes widened the moment he saw me, then he sighed in relief. Thank God, he said. I was getting worried. He began walking towards me. What's going on? I cried. Where the hell am I? Where's Jenny? The doctor held up his hand in a calmer manner. Calm down, sir. You've been in a coma for the past three years. I stopped shaking on the spot, eyes wide. What? You were the only survivor of an airplane crash. We've done everything we can to save you. It's a miracle you're in this condition as is. I'm sure your family will be happy to see you. My family? I said, blinking. What? No, this can't be right. I was... There were scars in the sky, and Cain. You must have been dreaming, the doctor said gently. That can happen to someone in a coma. I can assure you, whatever you've experienced wasn't real. I looked up at the doctor's smiling face. Where's Jenny? I croaked. Jenny? The doctor said, questioningly. My girlfriend. The doctor's face lit up. Oh, how fortunate. She's here right now. Do you want me to get her? I nodded slowly. When he left, I lay my head back on the pillow, trying to ignore the splitting headache I was experiencing. The door opened again, and I glanced to see a woman standing there, hand covering her mouth. It wasn't Jenny, it was Rosie. Rosie? I said, squinting my eyes at her. A sob escaped her throat as she entered the room, bending down next to my bed. Oh, Stuart, she said. Oh, baby, you're back. My name's not Stuart. Chapter 8 Rosie sobbed uncontrollably in the corner as a doctor frowned at me. Sir, he said gravely, it appears you are suffering from a case of severe amnesia. No, I'm not, I said firmly. My name's not Stuart. Then what is it? The doctor said, raising an eyebrow. I opened my mouth, and my mind went blank. I glared down at the straps on my legs and wrists, struggling against them briefly, before glaring back at the doctor. Why the hell am I restrained? Let me go! I've already explained this. We keep all coma patients restrained to prevent them from injuring themselves. The doctor said, tired. Bullshit, I cried. Utter bullshit. How can a coma patient hurt themselves? The doctor's eyes brightened when he glanced to the door. At that moment, a nurse came in, holding a blank VHS tape, while another wheeled in an old television. The doctor turned back to me, smiling. This will explain it. He said. He walked over to Rosie, put a hand on her shoulder, and led her out of the room as a TV was plugged in and the VHS tape inserted. The nurses turned it on and then moved to the side as the doctor came back in. The screen hummed as a picture formed, revealing a smiling man in a blue coat. His eyes were green, and his smile didn't reach them. Hello, he said, his voice scratching in my ears through the static, like a razor blade. I see you've woken up from your coma. You are probably wondering what happened. Well, I can assure you, coma patients are in far more danger than you can imagine. Did you know, 9 out of every 10 coma patients kill themselves while sleepwalking? The fuck? I said. Then the doctor shushed me. It's true. And did you know, 3 out of 5 coma patients never wake up, instead becoming sleepwalkers? Oh, it is true. I can assure you of that. See, you may be asleep, but your brain is still working like normal. And it's doing all those normal things, like making your arms and legs move. During this time, you may be imagining that you're living your everyday normal life, like making coffee or drinking tea. In truth, you could be strangling someone you love or walking into a busy highway. Two cartoon figures, both paper cutouts, appeared on screen, one showing a sleeping man strangling his smiling cheerful wife, while the other was sleepwalking right into the road, then getting smashed into poorly rendered pieces by an oncoming truck. That's not all. Your brain can even lie to you. Isn't that crazy? Imagine your brain making you think that you're in your living room watching TV when you're spending years of your life walking around the same empty room, completely asleep, with no hope of waking up. 
It's crazy. Got that right. I muttered sarcastically. The man on the screen seemed to cringe slightly. That's why your local hospital staff is taking every precaution to see to it you are okay. They can do things like restrain you, inject you with sedatives, and, in extreme cases, amputate your limbs. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but it has to be done. Not just for your safety, but for others. Static briefly flashed across the screen before the image began to shake, replaced with a different one. My eyes widened at what I saw. Jenny? Then the screen returned to normal. The world won't be all that different from when you fell into the coma, but a few things might still shock you. Don't worry though, everything will be okay. Your doctor and nurses will take good care of you. Then the screen turned off. What the fuck was that horseshit? Mr. Perkins, please, don't use that language. <sighs> the doctor sighed. No, I said firmly. My name isn't Stuart Perkins. It's... it's... fuck, I don't know. But we do, the doctor said softly. We know who you are. We're trying to help you. Help me? Help me? You just showed me a pack of bullshit. How do you know it's bullshit? The doctor made air quotes with his fingers. I opened my mouth, then began stammering. A person in a coma is... They can't just wake up. And why is that? Hmm? Because... Because... Because the brain has endured horrendous trauma and thus has to shut down for a while until it recovers. Though it still functions as normal, like on autopilot. I assure you, this is standard procedure to restrain a coma patient. You're lucky, as we might have had to amputate your limbs if you weren't. What the fuck is this about? I shrieked at the doctor. Explain to me how you can even remotely have a legal- It's perfectly legal, the doctor snapped at me. I can even show you the law in question. The Coma Act of 1927. It's been in effect for years. It's taught in the first semester of medical school. <sighs> then the doctor sighed, turning to the nurses. Then he turned back to me. Mr. Stewart, I'm afraid we might have to perform a lobotomy. I blinked at him, speechless. No, I said. No, you can't. Yes, the doctor said, tired. We can. The Lobotomy Act of 1987 was finalized last year. It's not 1987, I sputtered. It can't be. I was in the year 2019. A delusion of your damaged brain, the doctor said sadly, shaking his head. But I assure you, we can fix it. As if on cue, a nurse came in, carrying a syringe. He handed it into the doctor's bare hand, who then turned to me. Please, hold still, he said. No! I cried, shaking and struggling as the nurses grabbed my limbs, holding me in place. The doctor loomed over me, grabbing my arm and pressing the tip of the syringe against it. This will only sting for a moment. He said, then pressed it underneath my flesh and into my blood vessel. I screamed, then blacked out. Then I was... on a hill, sitting on a blanket. There's a girl next to me, with tan skin and blue eyes like the sky. She turns to me, flashing a flawless smile as her hands run through her untamed hair. What did I do to deserve you? I asked her, and she laughed, before leaning in close. Her lips pressed against mine and I sighed, gently holding onto her arm. When she drew back, she stroked my cheek with her fingers, softly smiling. Wake up, she whispered. You have to wake up, baby. You have to wake up. D my eyes snapped open to find myself in the hospital room. But it was not the clean, sparkling room from before. It was covered in what looked like spider webs, each one collecting into cocoons in each corner. I began gasping and looked around raising my head. Then it was forced back down onto the pillow. There was something wet in my hair, and screaming. I mean the screaming was in my hair, then going into my skull. Like when you speak, you hear your voice through your own skull. I began to glance upward, catching a glimpse of a large caterpillar, then woke up again to see a large light above my head, shining into my eyes. I blinked and tried to raise my hands, then leather bit into my wrists. I glanced down and found leather straps around my wrists, ankles, and chest. 
That was when the doctor loomed over me. He was still wearing his clothes and no face mask. I recoiled from him when he began speaking. Mr. Perkins, he said. Good to see you. Now we can begin. He held out a hand. A nurse put an oversized corkscrew into it. The doctor came forward, using both hands to hold it over my forehead. Please, no, I stammered. Don't do this. We have to, Mr. Perkins, he said. Then his eyes flashed green, like the man from the VHS tape. When he spoke again, his voice was like a razor blade on my eyeball. We have to. The end of the corkscrew pressed against my skin, began to twist, then stopped when somebody spoke. The doctor glanced around, confused. What was that? He hissed. Then the voice spoke up again, much clearer, in that infantile tone. Seen my shoe? I know them. I know who that is. While the doctor was looking away from me, I began straining against the straps on my wrists. I grunted, pulling harder, then one snapped off. The doctor spun around, eyes wide as my free hand shot out and grabbed a massive corkscrew, pushing it away from my forehead and leaving a jagged cut against my skin. The doctor took a few steps back, mouth open in shock, to reveal a dark, gaping hole. No tongue, no teeth, no gums, nothing. Impossible, he hissed. Impossible, I won't let Hello have this fun. Not with you. The doctor roared in a thousand voices and charged at me, but I had already broken my hand out of the other strap. Without thinking, I swung my fist at his head, punched him, and everything exploded again. When I woke up, Mickey Mouse was standing over me, axe by his side, but he wasn't looking at me. I could feel something on my head, and as I raised my hands to find a thick, massive, girthy thing, divided into segments, and covered in what felt like eyes, noses, and mouths. Awake, are we? said the unmistakable voice of Moloch. You're stronger than I thought, but it won't save you. You're mine. 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 My fingers dug into the thing on my head, and, with a painful cry, I began to rip it off, pulling my head away from it. With a wet tear, pieces of my scalp were ripped off before I was finally free. I rolled over on the hard ground, pushing myself away. Moloch was screeching in pain, his tongue swinging towards me. He didn't have a skin mask on his face anymore revealing a thousand green eyes, each one from a different animal. You can't escape from me, Moloch hissed, already moving towards me as his tongue swam forward. Then there was a flash as something slammed into it. Something embedded. Moloch screamed. Mickey Mouse drew back the axe and swung again, smacking it into his carapace. What? He shrieked, drawing back from the masked man. No, no, what are you? This is impossible. I am a former angel of heaven. I sat near the Lord himself. You're just a human. You both are. Oh, said a deep rumbling voice, followed by a thumping nearby. I turned to see the form of Beelzebub behind me, his glaive held loosely in one hand. Beelzebub, Moloch hissed. What are you doing here? Fuck off, this is my prey. Beelzebub snorted. Your lies are in vain, brother. You've only ever been able to taunt those weaker than you until they can fight back. Mickey raised his swung axe again, causing Moloch to scamper back. This human, he's different. There's something about him, something... I didn't want to just lay there and do nothing, so I reached into my pocket, then smirked. Hey, asshole, I said, pointing the pistol at Moloch. Eat this. When I pulled the finger... My arm shot back from the recoil. Moloch at first laughed, until one of his other legs exploded. Are you fucking serious? He shrieked. This is not happening, not to me. I'm one of the generals of hell. Beelzebub sighed. A poor one, you envious spider. I'll see you in the void, you incompetent child. Then he flew off again, without so much as glancing over his shoulder. I am not incompetent. Moloch shrieked after him when Mickey's axe managed to land in his carapace. 
I began firing wildly at him, each bullet impacting onto his shell. Mickey's swings came down harder and faster, splitting open the shell and revealing the organs within. By the time he stopped, Moloch was laying on the pavement, his legs broken in several places as he twitched. His tongue, all the faces gone from it, hung uselessly out of his mouth. No. No. This isn't possible. I... His eyes flashed towards me, burning with envy. You should have been like all the others on my tongue, screaming in torment, in their own little hells of my design. You... Shut up, I said, pointing the gun at him and then firing as Mickey swung his axe into his head. His eyes exploded into a fountain of green gore and pus. His corpse began to fade slowly, becoming first transparent before vanishing altogether. I raised my hand into the empty space it had one been. I was breathing, shocked beyond belief. I raised my hand into my bleeding temple, feeling the pieces where my scalp had been ripped off. Then Mickey spoke. Will you help me find my shoe? I turned to him. Breadcrumbs was still clustered around the mouth of the mask, and I looked down at his axe, covered in pieces of Moloch and other blood. Sure, I said slowly if you can help me. Chapter 9 It was odd, working with someone who had earlier tried to kill me. But I had no choice. I couldn't find Rosie and Kane, and Mickey had just saved my life. If it was out of the goodness of his heart, or just his own insanity, I'll never know. I walked slowly behind him, watching his axe. At any moment, he could turn around and cleave my head off, like he'd done to Moloch. But how had he done that? More importantly, how had I managed to injure him? Those bullets hadn't been anything special, and neither had his axe, as far as I knew. Speaking of bullets, I found it harder to reload this pistol than I first thought. I'd tried to but I had such trouble with it that I very nearly gave up until the spare clip slipped in. Even so, none of the bullets had seemed to have crosses engraved on them or anything like that. So how had they hurt a demonic creature like Moloch? Faith, my granddad said. Faith is a powerful thing. You've got a little bit of it, not a lot, but just enough to keep you safe for what's coming. <sighs> I sighed, then stuck out a hand in my pocket and stopped. Mickey did the same without so much as missing a beat. Why did you stop? He said in an infantile voice. We need to find my shoe. I'm missing a rosary, I said, digging around in my pockets. Have you seen it? Mickey's head tilted to the side. What's a rosary? It. Does it have my shoe? Oh boy. I sighed, shaking my head. No, I answered. I don't think so. We resumed walking. I didn't want to talk, still wary of the crazy person with an axe capable of killing demons. But silence can be an unbearable thing. Then I noticed something. I looked up to the sky. The scars were gone. Oh, said Mickey. Are you looking for the scars? I spun around to face him. You, you know of the scars as well? Mickey nodded slowly. He's on the other side of them, he said. Mommy's boyfriend. My eyes widened slowly. Your mommy's... what? Mommy has to be his girlfriend, Mickey continued softly. Because Haman said so. I was about to say something else when I heard a click behind me. Hands where we can see them, said a human voice. Great, more soldiers, and this time I didn't have Beelzebub to save me. I did as I was told, holding up my hands slowly. I fully expected to be shot on the spot, until a new voice spoke up. Is it him? He said. It was a rich, low voice, with a distinctively dark edge to it. I felt a chill go up my spine as footsteps slowly approached me. Mickey didn't move at all, just looking at someone behind me. He saw the scars, he said softly. Mr. Haman, he saw the scars. That made me spin around. He was a tall man with a dark beard and cruel eyes. 
He wore a suit and tie which was entirely out of place in this hellhole. Behind him were several soldiers, who were all pointing their guns at me. He chuckled. Very good, young one, he said with a perfect English accent. Very good. Your mother will be most happy. Then he turned to me. So, you're the one, the boy whose grandfather beat the devil. Uh, I was expecting something more impressive. My master is waiting for you. Then a smirk appeared on his lips. And your girlfriend, Jenny, isn't that her name? My eyes widened. What have you done to her? I hissed, lowering my hands and taking a few steps forward. I swear to God, if you set one hand on her... He moved faster than I thought possible, slamming a fist into my stomach. I groaned as the wind was knocked out of me slumping over onto the ground. He chuckled. You swear to God, to the Hebrew Sky King, sitting in the clouds, watching all this. He swept a hand outward, taking in the entire town in one gesture. Suffering and bloodshed. That mongrel has abandoned this place. A fist slammed into my back, forcing me to my knees. I glanced up, just in time to see his foot filling my vision before everything went black. When I woke up, I was laying on a concrete floor, surrounded by sounds of weeping and moaning. A roof was above my head, from which hang hooks and chains. I groaned as I sat up, bumping into something. I turned around to see an elderly woman, her knuckles bleeding. Back turned to me as she chanted something over and over. There were other people nearby, several dozen of them, all huddled together, crouching on the floor. I began to stand up. Hey, I turned to see a soldier nearby, pointing his gun at me. On the ground, now. I did as I was told. This isn't happening, said a voice nearby. I turned sharply to see a man with a bloody gash where his ear should be. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. Hey, whispered a familiar voice. I turned to see Rosie nearby. Hey, cuntbag, glad you're alive. What happened? I whispered back. We got attacked by some soldiers and that eight-legged freak. Moloch, he's dead. Rosie's eyes widened. Oh crap, Riddy. Thank God, but... Look, Kane's gone. I don't know where he went, but they grabbed me and dragged me here. Why? Rosie answered me by pointing at the center of the warehouse. I followed her finger. The first thing I noticed was the pit of fire, surrounded by a catwalk. Haman was marching along it as soldiers dragged people up to it, then threw them into the fire. They screamed only briefly before being shot dead. The soldiers turning away. Others were throwing in white discs of bread, golden objects with religious iconography on them. Christian, Islamic, Jewish, even Buddhist. What the fuck? I said stunned. Then a man in black robes with a long white beard was dragged up. A rabbi. Haman stopped, grinned, and marched over to him. <laughs> well, he laughed, voice filling the warehouse. Another one? How pleasant. Tell me, do you know who I am? The rabbi paused, gazing into his face. His eyes widened. You! He said, you, you live. Did you really think some silly whore and her bastard of a cousin could kill me? Me? <laughs> Would you like to hear what I've been doing all these years? Haman became thoughtful. There was a time during the First Crusade. I was with one Count Emiko. Ah, uh, pride is such an easy thing to manipulate. Then there was Germany. Ah... Uh, that was my favorite time. Back in the 1930s, when hate was at its height, and Hitler swayed the crowds with my guidance. The rabbi spat in his face. Rat! He shrieked, struggling against the soldiers holding his arms. You vile little rat! You despicable cur! Jehovah will strike you down and send you to Jehina. You will burn. Haman barely even flinched. 
Instead, he took out a cloth from his pocket, slowly wiped his face, then grabbed the rabbi by the beard, pulling him in close. No, he hissed, so loudly everyone else went quiet, turning to watch. You burn. Then he grabbed him by the arms, turned and flung him into the pit. The rabbi screamed. Don't kill him, Haman shrieked, turning to the soldiers. Don't. His suffering will be long. Then he turned back to the pit, a sick light in his eyes. He smiled, leaned in close, and inhaled through the nostrils, then laughed. He's done that with every rabbi they've found, Rosie whispered. And it's not just priests or rabbis they've burned. I've even seen a few imams thrown in there. Why? I said, voice hoarse. Why are... Why are people helping him? Look, uh, don't trust me on this, but... Rosie was cut off when the doors of the warehouse slammed open. When I turned over to see, I inhaled sharply. It was Beezlebub, accompanied by those demonic werewolves. But that wasn't the most shocking thing. No, it was a man standing in front of him, wearing a green uniform with medals on his breast. His eyes surveyed the warehouse, widening with blatant rage. Then they settled on the man on the catwalk. Haman! He shrieked, marching forward. Beezlebub followed behind, his pets at his heels. General! Haman called back. You're finally here. What in the fuck are you doing? This is needed, Haman shot back. If you wish to ensure your country becomes the dominant power in the world, these sacrifices must be made. Sacrifices. The general spat. He gestured to the people in the corner. Look at these people. They're Americans. They don't deserve to be treated like this. Why not? Haman retorted. Why not? I've already ensured that the gates to hell will open, and an army to conquer this world will be yours. I don't want an army, the general shot back. I want my son. I may have agreed to this but that doesn't mean you're the one in charge. No, Haman said, eyes narrowed. It means you're a hypocrite. You come in here, furious at what I've done, when it was all part of something you agreed to. I've changed my mind, the general growled. The deal's off. Haman chuckled, before glancing at Beezlebub. Kill him. No, Beezlebub answered. What? Haman sputtered. Who do you think told me what was actually going on? The general growled. He jerked a thumb at Beezlebub. This guy. Seems even fallen angels think you're a cunt. Moloch, Hammond cried. Moloch is dead, Beezlebub answered. I saw it happen myself, and so is Valak. Both have returned to hell. Hammond's eyes widened. No, he said. You cannot do this to me. I am the main servant of Hellel. Then he glared at Beezlebub. You! You rebelled against God! Now you turn against me? I did, Beezlebub muttered. I turned against the Lord, against Allah. But that does not mean I am devoid of honor. I am the Lord of the Hunt, not Lord of the Slaughter. And this has gone too far. There was a silence as people stared at the two figures, stunned beyond belief. A few of those huddling nearby, began to rise up off the ground. Then Haman laughed again. I always knew this would come, he said, a smug smirk on his face, and have made the necessary precautions. What? The general said, drawing a pistol and leveling it at Haman. Then one of the soldiers began screaming. I turned to see one of them doubling over, clutching their stomach. When they screamed, their helmet fell off, revealing the face of a woman. What have you done? Beezlebub said softly, Hellhounds. He whistled, and the demonic werewolves, Hellhounds, by his side, charged forward, going right for the woman as she fell onto her back, still screaming. I could see her thighs becoming wet from here with water and blood. There was a flash and the Hellhounds shrieked, the flashing of an axe blade flying up and down as a plastic Mickey Mouse mask became stained with blood. No, he said calmly. No hurt, mommy. The woman shrieked again. D 
Did you know, Haman said coolly, that there is no such thing as the Antichrist, a child born of Satan and a human woman who will bring about the end of the world? Of course, Haman smiled, gesturing to Mickey. That doesn't mean it is impossible to produce a child of such origin. One of the hellhounds struck Mickey, knocking away his mask. The face underneath was a lumpy, tumorous overgrowth, covered in scorch marks and blisters with dark eyes. He cried and swung his axe, plunging between the hellhound's eyes. There was a blast and I ducked down, turning to see the general's pistol had fired. I looked back to a still smirking Haman. Do you really think human weapons can save you now? I've been alive longer than Christ was born. I've learned a few things. The woman continued screaming. The general spun around and began barking orders, demanding that the soldiers nearby do something. Then the screaming stopped, and a crack split the air. I turned back to the prone, still form, of the soldier. A bloody hand, wrist wrapped in a golden chain, burst forth from it. Then it settled onto the ground besides the body. He's here, Beezlebub said raising his glaive and pointing it at the corpse. Another arm, also shackled by a golden chain, emerged, landing on the other side. Both hands pushed upward. A head emerged from the stomach. Long, white hair, stained by blood, descended from his temples. Broad, lean shoulders followed as a naked torso, perfectly muscled, pushed itself upward. The head whipped upward revealing a red star on his forehead, eyes closed. The man's hands left the floor as the rest of his body rose up slowly from the dead woman. You bastard, the general muttered, turning his pistol to the man. Go to- No, the man said and snapped his fingers. The general's head twisted over his shoulders, turning a full 180 degrees. His body fell backward with a dull thud. No, the man said again. He hovered above the ground, blood dripping from his feet. No, there will be no interruptions. Floating across a dead woman beneath him, his feet lightly touching the ground, and he took a few steps forward. I saw his footprints, left in blood. They were a V, with a straight line down the middle. The man sighed and his eyes opened, focusing on me instantly. They shimmered like a crow's wing. Rejoice said the man softly. Come, reach out, and touch faith. Chapter 10 The man remained still, blood dripping down his body. Then the blood froze and moved beginning to collect and swirl about his chest, limbs, thighs, and neck. It shimmered in the light, hardening into a soft, leathery texture. His eyes never left my face, studying it with a salacious fascination. Rejoice, he said again. Freedom is at hand. No one dared say a word as he began walking towards us, swaying his hips. I apologize. There have not been proper introductions. Then he smiled, the kind of smile that make a snake's blood freeze. I am a man of wealth and taste, he laughed. And you are my devoted converts. Converts? Someone said as he stood up. Converts? What the hell are you talking about? Freedom, the man said. True, pure, freedom. That is what I offer. How? Someone else spoke up. We just saw you kill a man. Because he wished, the man answered her, to oppress you. That is what you humans do best, yes? Oppress each other. Yes, it is, I know. I've seen you all do it for centuries. What else can humanity do aside from scramble on a pile of corpses to reach the top? You walk in a graveyard. Do you know that? Sleep, eat, fuck, kill. In the graveyard you call Earth. And who are you to tell us this, cunt? Rosie said. 
Who are you? The man slowly turned to her, then glanced at me, briefly. I am your liberator. Bullshit! Someone else cried out. Get thee behind me, Satan! The man turned to this individual and laughed again. Ah, now you come out and say it. The name you gave me. Accuser. Adversary. Tell me, what have I done which you humans have not done to each other? Have I ever killed? Raped? Perhaps, but if so, what makes it wrong? God does. Someone else cried out. Then, where is God to protect you all? Silence. Why would that king, loving God, not intervene here and prevent such a catastrophe? Perhaps it is because he does not care for you. Lies. Ah, that is what he said. I am the father of lies, yes? And does that not make God the grandfather of lies? How can we believe you? The devil laughed at this. My, my, he said in a silky voice. How absurd. Believe me. Me? Obviously you shouldn't. You must believe yourselves. Then he became thoughtful. Tell me, he said, which among you is an atheist? Slowly, a few people raised their hands. Now, which among you, at this moment, is lying to me? The first few people kept their hands up. My, my, he said with a soft chuckle. For shame. Lying to the father of lies. Does that give you any superiority over me? His eyes settled back on me, and he pointed. You, he said. Stand up and come here. I didn't move. I didn't dare move. I was rooted to the spot. He smiled all the wider, revealing perfect, unnaturally white unnaturally human, teeth. Come, he said. I do not bite. I still didn't move. Come on, the devil said again. My master, the Agagite said, slowly walking down from the crosswalk. Did you make for me a son? <clears throat> Haman cleared his throat. Yes, I, I did. I had to clone it. Beelzebub, the devil said now turning to the demon who was pointing a glaive at him. Do you hate my son? Beelzebub smiled. The devil turned to the maskless Mickey. Boy, he said softly, then pointed at Beelzebub. Do you know this man killed your mommy? What? Mickey said. But I need to bring mommy my shoe. How tragic, the devil said again, with genuine sorrow. Now, she'll never even know she had a son. Silence permeated the warehouse. What? What do you mean? Your mother never even knew you existed, the devil said. And yet, you loved her with all your heart. What a shame she never had a chance to love you back. All because... Hillel turned back to Beelzebub with a fierce look in his eyes. Of this traitorous vermin. Because of him, your mother is dead. Beelzebub began laughing after a pause. Do not trust him, he snarled. He lied to me. He's doing the same. It happened so fast, none of us could even process it. Mickey had lunged forward with a blank fast, his axe swinging through the air and down on Beelzebub. The lord of the hunt only had a moment to block the blow with his glaive. Surprise clear on his face. You killed mommy, Mickey whined. Why did you kill mommy? The soldiers still in the warehouse had their guns raised on both figures. Open fire, the devil said softly. They didn't listen. The devil sighed, then opened his mouth again, raising his voice slightly. Open, he said. Fire. His voice, despite its pitch, filled the warehouse. Then gunfire replaced it. Bullets impacted on Mickey's body, shredding it to pieces before it slumped to the floor. Beelzebub recoiled in shock before focusing on the white-haired man. You, he cried, seeming to ignore the bullets hitting his flesh. Hillel, you vile, contemptible serpent, I never should have joined you. That is a mistake you cannot take back, Hillel replied calmly. 
and never will change. No, Beezlebub growled, already charging forward. But I can at least claim vengeance for it. He roared, charging forward, then vanished. There wasn't even a brief fade or indication something was happening. Quicker than we could blink, he was gone. Fool, Hillel muttered. Foolish lord of the hunt. Return to hell and the void. He turned back to me. That, he said calmly, is my power. Impressive, isn't it? Please, do as I say now, and come to me. I still didn't move. Hillel glanced at the people around me. When I said I came to bring freedom, he said, I meant it. Freedom from the laws set in place by God. Ask yourself this. How can God claim not to tolerate things like rape, murder, but allow them to happen in the first place? Hmm? Who is he to say they are wrong? Shut up, said a woman who stood up now as well. Just shut up. Of course rape and murder are wrong. Why? Halel asked. Because you're killing a person, she continued firmly. And when you rape them, you're violating them, taining them. What happens when you kill someone? The woman blinked, confused. What? When you kill someone, you free the soul from the body. Halel continued. Nothing less, nothing more. A life is but a speck, and you don't pay much mind when you brush away any specks of dust, no? And rape, that most disgusting of crime. Ask yourself this. If rape is so wrong, why does it exist in the first place? What are you talking about? I refer to the fact no loving God would allow something as vile as rape to exist without a reason. Perhaps he wishes to entertain himself through your suffering. The stunned silence which followed allowed Hillel to smile triumphantly. Now you understand, he continued. What I mean when I say I offer freedom, I offer you a chance to be free of God's lies and cruelties. I offer you what it means to truly live. Or would you rather be a robotic husk, housing a soul, waiting for the day when death claims you? Wouldn't you rather enjoy true pleasure? His smile was once again salacious. You love a woman. Yes? Does not the Lord say for you to love another woman is wrong? This is the same God which declares that rape and murder are wrong. How can he, who claims to be the God of love, claim this while condemning your own love? Her eyes were wide with shock at this, and she sat down slowly, hands on her face. Now, he said again, turning back to me, get up. I still didn't move. Hillel smiled, his lips reaching each ear. Fine, he said before turning back to the crowd. Jenny. I spun around, scanning the crowd for her. Then there were a few footsteps from the other end of the warehouse. I turned to see Jenny walking out of the shadows slowly, shaking from head to toe. My heart sank when she stopped next to Haman and Hillel. Jenny, he said. Your boyfriend, he doesn't know, does he? No, what? I said, glancing between them. Jenny began to cry as tears ran down her face. All of this, Hillel said, is her fault. Jenny sobbed. What? I blinked, stunned. I'm sorry, she said. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. That this would happen? <laughs> Hillel laughed. Oh, but it has. And what did you ask in return for Haman's assistance? Haman smirked. An abortion. My blood turned cold at that. Jenny and I had never had sex. No, I said, shaking my head. No, this can't be. She needed someone to help her cover up her sin, Hillel said. Haman agreed to do so. I didn't know, Jenny shrieked. I swear I had no idea any of this would happen. She turned to Haman. You said you'd help me. Oh, but I shall, Haman said with a smirk. There was a glint, and a knife appeared in his hand. Now, hold still. I am no expert, but I do believe this will dispose of your unwanted guest. He laughed, drawing back his hand. No! I screamed, rushing forward as Jenny shrieked. Then I felt a hand on my throat, and I was looking into a pair of dark eyes that shimmered like a crow's wing. You shouldn't trust your senses, 
Hillel said with a soft, amused sneer. I glanced at Haman and Jenny. Jenny's eyes were wide, staring at Haman's empty hand. She backed away, breathing heavily. Converts, Hillel said, turning to them. Listen closely. The time has come. Do you wish to live past this night? No answer. If so, Hillel continued, there is something you must do. He dropped me to the ground with a thud. I groaned. Jenny shrieked, and then she was beside me on hands and knees, clutching her stomach. I'm sorry, she sobbed. I'm sorry I was tricked, I swear. Something clattered between us, glinting in the light. Come, Hillel said again. Come forward. Free yourselves upon those who brought all this upon you, and then you will be spared. How can we trust you? Someone spat, the first man who'd spoken up. You expect us to rape and murder these two? After everything? His head exploded in flames, then so did the rest of his body. Halal laughed. You were never going to be a convert, he said before turning to everyone else. Now please ask yourself this. If, on this night, to survive, you had to free yourselves upon these two individuals. Could you live with yourselves, knowing you'd never have to face the consequences for it? Save your life at the cost of theirs. I began to weep, stunned when I saw someone stand up and begin moving through the shock, horrified crowd, toward me and Jenny. Then another, and another. Oh God, I said. Oh God, no. God? Halal said mockingly, has abandoned you. I gulped, my eyes becoming wet, and turned to Jenny. I love you, I said as tears streamed down my face. Someone had picked up the knife while another person unbuckled their pants, looking away from us. I love you so much. Then there was a flash of light, and Halal screamed, his voice becoming distorted and almost broken. The people in front of us shielded their eyes, cursing and screaming. Then I heard a voice in my ears, one I hadn't in years. Don't worry, laddie, he said. Your granddad is here to protect you. Chapter 11 So, this is the end of my story. How about that? Look, I'll be level with you. I was a fucking idiot through all of this. I barely understand any of what happened next. What I do know is this. I survived. Not everyone else did. It was so... surreal. Grandad was there, and he was... He was shining. His skin, it was made of light. When he spoke, he was so calm. So peaceful, so serene. It was... beautiful. Don't worry, Michael. He told me. I'll handle this. Then he turned to Hillel. So, he said, you came here and tried to get my grandson raped and killed? You, Hillel snarled, his shimmering eyes turning red with hatred. How dare you? Oh, don't give me that, you hypocrite. Grandad spat, taking a few steps forward. Hillel backed away. There it is, Grandad said. For all your power, in the face of the Lord, you are helpless. There is nothing you can do that would make me abandon my grandson. Nothing at all. Now the time has come for you to get what's yours. Hillel snarled and lunged forward, punching my granddad across the face again and again and again. Granddad staggered under each blow, then grabbed a fist. Hillel growled when my granddad tightened his fist, then roared when he was punched in the stomach. Come on, Grandad said. You pathetic worm, is that the best you can do? Then one of the walls exploded, and in came the same tank I had seen earlier in the night. Riding on it was Cain, who smiled when he saw Haman. Agagite, he said, jumping off the tank. I am here. Haman was gone, though. I couldn't see him anymore. And then I heard it. The rattling of the chains. I looked up to see them moving of their own accord, descending from the ceiling like snakes and slashing into the people nearby. Men, women, children, elderly. Screams of pain, horror, and sorrow filled the warehouse. 
People were running and screaming. I lost sight of Jenny. I stood up, ducking under the chains when I caught sight of Rosie, dangling upside down from one of the chains, blood dripping from her face. No, I said. No. Then I heard Jenny scream and turned to see her near the fire pit. She was being dragged up the platform by Haman. I immediately began running towards her, only for something to slice my tendon. I screamed and fell to the ground. A chain was in my tendon, yanking me backward. No, no, no! Then there was an explosive roar that deafened my ears. The tank had fired, and Hillel screamed. I heard my granddad laughing as a chain went limp and began crawling towards Jenny and Haman. It was futile, but I had to at least try. I wasn't the one who saved Jenny, though. It was Cain. He seemed to come out of nowhere, turban falling off his head to reveal a burning mark. Haman only had a second to react before Cain grabbed him by the shoulders and lifted him into the air with ease. He threw him into the fire pit. Haman screamed while Cain watched. The pain in my leg was unbearable, not to mention my rib was acting up now. I couldn't hold myself together. I was on the verge of blacking out. This whole night had been too much. Then I felt something lifting me up from the ground. Grandad. Don't worry, Michael, he said. Everything will be fine now. It's going to be okay. I turned to see Hillel, his skin completely on fire, chains coiling around his arms. Then they were taunt. His eyes widened before he screamed in a thousand voices and was dragged backward by the chains. His body entered the decrypt corpse of the woman he emerged from, struggling to maintain a grip on this world. Back to nothing with you. Grandad spat. Back to hell. That was when I blacked out. I know, I know, anticlimactic. But I'd been through so much that night. My rib and tendon were broken. I had bruises on and in my body. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The first thing I wanted to do was find Jenny. Well, I didn't. She sent me a message. She... She couldn't stay with me anymore. She wanted some time alone after what had happened. That time became forever. And honestly, I'm fine with that. Sometimes I think about her and the kid she has. I hope she kept it and gave birth. I hope she's happy. You guys think I would go after her. Yeah, I know, but the things I saw on that night. When they say that a crimson alert never ends, they aren't speaking literally. My nightmares are always reliving that hellish night. I'm unable to even look at other people without thinking about if they would rape and kill someone just to save their own skin. The other day, I was at a coffee shop when I ran into one of the people who had accepted Hillel's offer. It was surreal. See, he just... he... Oh. He said quietly, You, uh, you were there, right? I glared at him. Look, he continued, I, I had to do it, you know, I have a family, they couldn't live without- Fuck off, I told him, and left the coffee shop. I'm going to die today. Stuff like that, and the military making him stay silent on what happened. God damn, I can't bear it anymore. There's nobody I can talk to about this. How do you explain this series of events? So many people I knew died on that night. So much death and chaos, everywhere, never ending. Always in my nightmares. I can't escape. A crimson alert never ends. I know I shouldn't do this, but... God forgive me. I can't live anymore. If there's one good thing about what I'm about to do, it's this. I'll get to see my granddad again.